newspaper and we're going to wind up on the newspaper right now but just remind you that in our conversation this morning it's all about the diaspora agenda for the Kenyans about 4 million Kenyans who are living abroad working studying abroad what is the agenda what are some of their concerns what are some of the challenges and of course the government's agenda for those Kenyans living abroad. But I'm not alone in studio to be having these conversations. Uh, I'm now joined in studio by the Principal Secretary of State Department for Diaspora Affairs, Rosalind Jogu. Jogu, a very good morning, Madam P.S. Karibu Sana to the studio. Thank you so much for it, having me and good morning. A very good morning to you indeed. A great and a pleasure to have you and making time for this very pertinent uh, conversation. But just very quickly, because I know we have to take a break mm -hmm. at some point. Um, it's been uh, almost three months since uh, you took over. Five, uh, five months. Five months. Oh my goodness! <laughs> then I must be behind. Yeah, <laughs> All right. So yeah, five, five months. months. So mm -hmm. five months since taking over office. So tell us. I mean, this is a very new, you know, state department. It was created by the president. Uh, how has it been for you? It's been extremely exciting. Mm -hmm. It's been um, a lot of hard work, a lot of long hours, early mornings, very late nights, mm -hmm. um, trying to get the. Um, enterprise set up. Mm. Um, it's been very engaging. There's been quite some travel um, and speaking with Kenyans from around the world. But also it's the kind of state department that has come with um, a lot of, how do you call it, good feedback almost immediately. Mm. Like this is what we needed. We're so glad that this is, you know, something that we're able to do now. So um, it's a uh, it's been the ride of a lifetime truly. very very exciting yeah all right mm -hmm. so we're gonna take that short break uh, but we come back we'll be having a much uh, deeper conversation with the principal secretary on those particular matters and also an update on the evacuation of kenyans from sudan remember that conflict is continuing to escalate in that part of the region so what's the progress we'll be getting more information from her we're going to be back in a short while the hashtag m live and tv stay with us In your paper this week, Congo War, enter SADC, exit ESC, the sphere, too many troops from different countries intervening in the country could lead to confusion on the ground. Talks for ESC, political federation, shift into high gear. Too many cooks could spoil the broth in the Sudan crisis. Samia pulls a first one on constitution review. Plus our opinion leaders. If I cared for Luca, I would be exclusively banking on women. LC Ayakuze rejoice for the Ugandan ghost will soon have nowhere to hide. Joachim Buembo. For this and more stories, get your copy of the East African. Kagoyangu, kona makarao. Majama wili wanyo likuwa nafakuwa nao, makondani. Alafu wewe, uko hapa. Wanyo nipoteza pesa ngapi wewe? Nzejo moz, misi snitch. Misi jaku snitch at all, wala itena. Misi na doya lunch, mto hiya jakula tangu jani. Misi kwa mtoto. Fanya jo? Tewa do. So when the coral is ready to be taken into the ocean, it is actually reef rangers who plant the coral, maintain it, and then do the outplanting as well.
All right, thank you for staying with us. You're watching AM Live on NTV. My name is Zainab Ismail. Once again, I am with Rosalyn Njogu. That's the Principal Secretary, State Department of Diaspora Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs. Thank you once again for joining us this morning. Now, many Kenyans, especially those that were living abroad, said this was long overdue, that we needed this, this you know, uh, entity, the State Department, that will look into our affairs. Looking at the mandate that you have, you know, and sitting in that policy making table, why is this so necessary? Because we have what, four million Kenyans living abroad? Is that the estimate? It's, it's anything between three and four million, mm -hmm. um, is what our numbers say. Yes. Um, and getting uh, a good figure, exact, right. exact data has been a bit of a challenge mm -hmm. because our policy has been uh, voluntary registration. Mm. Right, so uh, we don't have a law that requires you to register, um, but we have asked Kenyans to register over the years with the uh, embassies where they are at. Mm -hmm. um, Kenyans have not been very um, cooperative as far as registering with, uh, with the embassies is concerned, something mm -hmm. that we are hoping to work on and have them register with the State Department, because when they do register, then we're able to extend services in a, f in a timely fashion. Right. Um, but also when we have that kind of data, then we're able to plan better our mm -hmm. programming and so on. So the numbers are anything between three and four million. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a critical, critical uh, docket because there are several vulnerabilities that come with living abroad, mm -hmm. right? So you are not close to government, you're not mm -hmm. close to the usual services I usually have and so on. Uh, and being a foreigner anywhere has those kinds of vulnerabilities. So right. having a state department that specifically targets um, how to get resources to you, how to get help to you should help uh, be needed then becomes very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. So when uh, the president set up this state department by uh, executive order one of 2022 and then you know a, a little bit of a reconfiguration of government in the executive order of 2023, he gave us a very clear six-point mandate, all right, um, and it is to promote dialogue with Kenyans abroad, to uh, champion the rights and welfare of, of Kenyans abroad, um, to harness opportunities for them for employment um, and enterprise development, um, to create an incentive framework for uh, remittances, mm -hmm. to harness um, their savings and FDI um, and technology transfer, uh, and I believe the sixth one has to do with, um, uh, I think I've told you five, have I yes. told you five? Five. I'll give you the sixth one in just, no <laughs> in just a little bit. Correct. Mm -hmm. But um, ideally it's, it's welfare. Mm -hmm. So you, you can think of them in, in sort of, um, um, we think of it as a house. Mm -hmm. We start by building our house on a foundation of welfare and rights. Mm -hmm. If you can secure the welfare and rights of Kenyans abroad, mm -hmm. then you've built a very firm foundation. Right. And then you put in um, uh, the, the pillars. Mm -hmm. I've remembered the one that I had missed and it's sort of overarching. It's okay. mainstreaming um, diaspora's uh, involvement in the process of national development. Right. So then you build on these pillars of mainstreaming their involvement, investment, international opportunity, uh, uh, jobs and international opportunities, investments. And if you do that piece right, and we have, the, our model is a little house that uh, maybe a little bit later we can put up on social media for people to see. Mm -hmm. um, if you do the foundation right and the pillars right, then what eventually you have um, at the top is as a roof is uh, diaspora remittances and that sort of comes or rises naturally out of right, that conversation. Right, so right. so that's really the model and it's, it's very, in my estimation, very bottom up in terms mm -hmm. of how to, to serve the diaspora. So that's, that's the mandate. It's, it sounds, um, the goals I think in my mind are very clear mm -hmm. and in, in the mind of the people that I, you know, that I serve with are very, very clear. If we're talking about rights and welfare, that's where you put up all the business of ensuring people have consular services, mm -hmm. um, getting um, their uh, documents, mm -hmm. working with our embassies to get, and in this case, maybe the State Department for Immigration to make sure that it's easy for people to get their passports. Because I, I think, he, actually mm -hmm. it was yesterday mm -hmm. that the cabinet secretary talked about the same issue, mm -hmm. that what, uh, long, you, your, min, you know, you, your state department, in fact, will be yeah. in charge of the mobile consular services. Yes, we've rolled So out. what does this really mean? Because then Kenyans, it means that what consular services will be right next to all those Kenyans yes. who are living abroad. Absolutely. So the mobile consular services is one of the very first projects that we sort of launched when mm -hmm. we set up the state department. Yeah. And this came from the president's idea mm -hmm. that Kenyans shouldn't have to travel very, very far, extremely expensively to get to the embassy to have services available to them. Mm -hmm. 
when he gave this instruction, we were in DC during the US Africa summit. And the pain point at that, at that point was that if you wanted um, to get you know, your passport renewed, if you lost your ID, if you wanted to get birth certificates and so on, you either had to go all the way to DC mm -hmm. or you had to go to LA where we have a consulate. Right, so that was a pain point. If you right. have a family and right. you have three children and everybody needs to get a new generation passport, that will cost you a lot of money to fly everybody there to get their biometrics done, um, probably spend the night and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. he said, why can't we take, at home we're already doing hud huduma machinani. Right. Uh, how can we get services closer to the people? Mm -hmm. So we started this as a sort of a stopgap measure, but this is not the end state Zainab. The idea is that ultimately in the city that you live in, in the diaspora, mm -hmm. you should be able to walk up to um, to a center near you where you have your biometrics done and um, your fingerprints taken and so on and that stuff is, um, is captured and sent to the embassy. You never have to go in this case to DC or to LA again. Mm. So that's what the president wants. But in the intervening period until we, ha we are able to set up that system uh, with the State Department for Immigration, um, then, uh, then we sort of take the services on the road, mm -hmm. so to speak. So it's, well, it's not really a road show, but it's sort of like a road show. Right. Um, we have just finished, last, last month, I believe in March, mm -hmm. we finished uh, mobile consular services in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and we went around several cities, I believe it was about nine or more. Uh, no, I think it was maybe 12 mm -hmm. um, cities. And part of that process, we served thousands and thousands of Kenyans, right? Mm -hmm. And we were able to pick up applications for 3,000 and something passports um, and about 300 IDs, a number of birth certificates and uh, authentication of documents and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Basically, we brought services to the people. And what, what the videos uh, diasporian centers were inspiring because people showed up with their children who were born in the US who have never had a Kenyan So this document. actually even helps with the data that you hope to achieve it does. by getting the numbers of Kenyans it, who are it there. It gives us an idea of who is out there that we need to be serving, right. we need to be thinking about. Because now if you register your children and you get a Kenyan birth certificate, then they're in the system. And at the back of our minds as government, then we know there are 400 or you know whatever number, mm -hmm. there are, let's say, 50,000 mm -hmm. um, Kenyans born in the US between the ages of uh, zero and uh, six. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in the next X number of years, we need to be planning for them to have IDs and that. So we, it really is helpful for us uh, as far as planning is concerned. Right. So we're able to do this in the US with a lot of success. Mm -hmm. And the team in the US, um, the embassy teams, uh, you know, from our uh, in, um, DC office, from our LA office, um, the ambassadors there. We had a team joining from, you know, our State Department, but also from the State Department for Immigration. Mm -hmm. um, and they did an excellent, excellent job. They really worked. In some places, people worked uh, from 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. There are literally queues where people had to work overnight. 24 hours. Yes, just to serve Kenyans who showed up in large, large, large numbers than had registered, much yeah. larger numbers than had registered. Um, hugely successful. So because of that, now we have rolled out Canada yesterday, I believe, mm. um, starting out in Ottawa, moving to Toronto and so on. Uh, and the schedule is available again online and Kenyans have signed up mm -hmm. so that we hope. So how, how are you uh, getting the information out to those Kenyans who are in those, you know, parts like mm -hmm. Canada mm -hmm. and those even those cities within the U.S.? How are they getting the information? Is there The like embassies do an excellent job really? because the embassies put up, put out that information on the Correct. website. So, if, you know, diasporians really do need to keep an eye out on the embassies where they live, yeah. but also we put it out on our own social media, mm -hmm. we are in touch with diaspora associations who do a lot of the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. So diaspora associations will pretty much, and this is the beauty of, uh, of social media, Zainab, is that we'll do a flyer mm -hmm. that says, this is the schedule, okay, for, uh, for Canada. Mm -hmm. We'll send it out on our social media, on our, on our Twitter, on, on, um, um, on the embassy's social media, and then in no time, it will have gone round until it gets back to my WhatsApp, mm -hmm. because that's sort of how uh, the system works. So then um, you use a different associations. In the US, for example, we use associations such as um, uh, Kenyan churches, which are a number, Kenyan church associations within the US. Mm -hmm. And they give us um, 
even venues for free for us to be able to come and mount the services there and so on. So the diaspora associations are very strong mm. and they do a really, really good job in terms of mobilizing Kenyans to come and get services. Mm -hmm. So that's what, um, that's one of the things that's, that's going on. So after Canada, now we are rolling it out globally. So the different um, Do we have a time frame for that? It's going, it's ongoing. Right. Between now and the end of June, we'll have rolled out in almost uh, almost every one of our stations. Mm -hmm. So Kenyans who need to have consular services come close to them will be able to do that. In some places where we don't have certain services, for example, in Canada, we don't have ID issuing services. So if you lose your ID in Canada, or um, if, you're born, if you're a child born there and you get to 18, there really isn't anywhere for you to get an ID. Mm -hmm. You either would have to go the closest is uh, the U.S., so mm -hmm. D.C. or L.A., depending on you know, which, which coast you're on, or come home mm -hmm. to get an ID, which is extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so part of this NCS is actually to take IDs to Canada, okay. right? So for the first time, we're issuing IDs in Canada um, and, and, and so on. And you know, the National Registration Bureau has been very kind. They've sent us you know, a team uh, that is going. So it's really um, a number of different departments have had to come together to do that. Right. So this welfare and rights bit, um, Zainab, then tends to be, remember when I described the house, tends to be the foundation on which we build. Mm -hmm. Because if people have services, if people feel protected, if people know um, that you will come and get them if things are thick, then you're able to build everything else on that, on, on that sort of solid rock or solid bedrock of, of trust and of people knowing that they are, they are safe, that government is going to come. Um, and sort them out when they need, when they All need right. that. Mm -hmm. And even with the same, I mean, uh, one of the biggest concerns I think that comes from uh, those who are living abroad mm -hmm. is the issue of political participation, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, their uh, right to the voting. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there's still much more that needs to be done in terms of streamlining that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, of course, the IABC is an independent, mm -hmm. the eyes independent <laughs> body. But um, the diaspora constitutionally has a right to vote. Right. And the court has held that that right is to be achieved progressively. There's various schools of thought about how, what progressively means, right? Whether it is more uh, stations or whether it, is, whether it is to go wide or to go deep. Uh, in the last election, in the last two elections, we've had progressive sort of uh, registration and, and suffrage. And I hope now that we have, and really our plan. And I think uh, the past have, election, I think mm. we saw a much higher number than of, the, than of those the previous, than the the previous, previous election. Right. And now that we have a state department, a big part of mainstreaming uh, diaspora's um, involvement in national development, one of our mandates is really to make sure that more people can vote. Mm. How can we work with the IABC? And we're exploring these options to make sure that come 2027, uh, Kenyans are able to vote um, in in a more accessible way. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you're to vote, you would have to go to, there were just a number of stations uh, that you could vote from. Um, you would have to, if, depending on where you live, you'd have to travel you know, a long, long distance. If you live in um, LA, you have to go all the way to DC to vote, right? So a lot of people feel very patriotic, but uh, I think at some point people are like, I, I, I gotta choose how much money mm -hmm. this patriotism is going to cost me, right? So, so we want, people to be able to vote in more and more accessible ways. Mm -hmm. There are places, um, and this is really probably the, um, the end state of what you would hope for, mm -hmm. is that you would be able to have you know, more and more people vote. The Philippines, for example, which has a huge diaspora, mm -hmm. has an interesting uh, mode as far as their voting is, is, is concerned. Because they have a number of seafarers, seafarers start voting about two months before the election, the election date. Right. So they have a, an entire two months in advance to vote. The entire diaspora have a whole month before the close of elections mm. for them to bring in their vote. And then now, nationally, everybody else votes on election day. I don't think we are going there. Uh, our, our, I believe our, our elections are um, <laughs> complicated and, uh, and uh, hot button <laughs> enough for us to open up two months right. of, um, of elections. But they show us what is possible yeah. in terms of what are the different ways we could do this. What are some ways we could uh, use uh, technology to make sure that it is easier, cheaper, more secure mm -hmm. uh, for Kenyans living abroad to vote. So these are some of the things I think um, the president had in mind in setting up a state department to have somebody whose problem 
-hmm. this is for right. us to think about and see how we can we can deal with that. So 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 yes, um, political participation as far as voting is one of the big things in terms of mainstreaming their involvement. But you can also think about other areas. Mm -hmm. um, such as uh, right now the hot button issue, well, one of the ones that you know, are, are taking up all of the news cycles is the budget, mm. right? How can diasporians be involved in that process? Right. One of the things that we are doing is we launched our program uh, on public participation about, I want to say about two or three weeks ago. And basically what it is, is we mount a webinar where whoever owns that bill will sort of come and discuss it and give um, proposals on how do you think we could you basically open up uh, the give conversation them the voice. Cu yes curate the conversation so that Kenyans can come in and give their feedback mm -hmm. um, and that's captured so and depending on what area of public participation that is mm -hmm. so then you can have that either go to um, Treasury or if it is already the floor of the house then it can go to Bunge for mm -hmm. uh, for consideration mm -hmm. What we found on that first uh, session, Zainab, is we were, uh, Treasury had asked for feedback, public participation on the amendment of PFM regulations, uh, the PFM Act and uh, regulations on public debt. Mm -hmm. The conversation, I think, began at 6 p.m. Nairobi time. It ended at 11.30. P.m. P.m. Yeah. We had thought it would take two hours at most. Mm -hmm but Kenyans kept coming in. They engaged, the level of engagement and the depth of conversation was very, very rich. Right. So then you sort of take all of that feedback, you know, captured over five and a half hours, mm -hmm. uh, you collate that into a memorandum and then people are able to participate. So that we take conversations as far as public participation is concerned, mm -hmm. not necessarily off of social media, off of Twitter, or because there is a place for that, mm -hmm. but we want those voices on Twitter, we want those voices, um, on WhatsApp, I think WhatsApp groups, for example, is where a lot of public participation happens, right? right. So everyone is like, no, I don't like this. This doesn't make sense. So you want them. They need them their voices to be heard on a yes. bigger platform, on a more national platform, and on a, a more structured uh, way. It says that exactly. whatever they're saying is actually part of the agenda. There you go. And not just part of the agenda. You want to harness those voices and mm. you want to bring them to the place where it can make a difference. Mm. You can shout about a lot of things on WhatsApp and on Twitter and so on. But if you don't get your voice heard in Bunge, for example, as far as uh, changing law is concerned, and by the way, then that's it. On the on the mm -hmm. same, because I know that there's this, you know, sort of uh, unanimous, um, mm -hmm. what do I call it, um, decision, not decision, mm -hmm. but really uh, concern mm -hmm. from those who are living abroad, mm -hmm. that they w also want representation within parliament. Mm -hmm. So I know this is something that they are pushing for mm -hmm. to have, you know, mm -hmm. a nomination of one of those people within the parliament mm -hmm. here in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is something that is viable, can work, and is it something that is necessary? So that's definitely one of the things that comes up every mm -hmm. in every diaspora, maybe in many diaspora engagements that we have, right? right? The need to take public participation to the next level, the need to have your voice in Bunge. That would require legislative change, right? For us to be able to have um, recognition of the 48th county, right. right? So that would require that the law changes. Uh, of course, as far as political parties are concerned and nominating of senators and nominating of, um, of parliamentarians, that's something that can be done, right? Mm -hmm. um, political parties can choose um, and we hope increasingly they choose um, to nominate, you know, a member of the diaspora into Bunge. The downside of that is that the minute that they come to Bunga, they sort of cease to be a diasporian mm -hmm. because, the business, so? bus because the business of the house is really conducted in Nairobi. Right. Unless, again, we structure our system so that you're able to participate, you know, uh, virtually, which I, uh, so, there, so there is a sort of a, um, uh, a ways to go as far as that's concerned. But there's nothing, I don't think there's anything wrong in them ceasing to be a diasporian because you bring the experience and the, and the, um, the lived realities mm. of being a diasporian. When you do come, um, when you do come to Bunge, you're able to speak to the pain points very, very clearly. Mm. Um, so that would be one way to do it. Uh, and maybe that is actually a quick win in terms of those sort of um, nominations. Mm -hmm. We do have, um, you know, committees in Bunge that now 
uh, give voices to um, to diaspora. Mm -hmm. We have a, a committee on labor, uh, diaspora and labor migration. We have uh, the sort of the mother committee or the older committee uh, that oversights, you know, my state department, for example, that's a committee on foreign relations, defense uh, and foreign relations. Mm -hmm. um, and our engagement with those two committees, uh, one on national cohesion and as well and one in Senate, our engagement with those committees basically allow us now as a state department to sort of do advocacy work for purposes of the diaspora. And basically, I will have conversations with, with uh, these parliamentarians, for example, and say these are some of the issues that diaspora is raising. Mm. You are the committee that is tasked with looking at um, diaspora and migrant labor. Mm -hmm. Could you take these ones before Bunge? Mm -hmm. So it is not that there is com a complete voicelessness. There has been attempts to sort of bring um, that voice and that representation. Mm -hmm. um, and what you might have seen also, Zainab, is that uh, in the recent past, particularly as we did uh, the MCS that I mentioned um, in, uh, in, in the US, is some of this Bunge committee actually went and met with Kenyans abroad and asked what, are some, of, yes, mm. what are some of the issues and how is the State Department um, uh, serving you? You know, is Ms. Jogu's department actually working or not? And they got that feedback, mm -hmm. which is very good. But they got but that feedback. They still feel they would need representation they do. of one yes. of their own. Yes, absolutely. You know, in a, yeah. In a, so if that, if that is something that, uh, again, of course, that is uh, outside of my scope. Correct. Uh, but if that is something that can be done, then that really would give uh, sort of that um, push. Right. Because as, as the executive, we do have our limits in terms of what we can do. Yeah. But you would want them represented as well within um, the legislature. Right. Absolutely. Let's talk about the issue of, uh, you know, exporting the, uh, you know, labor. Mm -hmm. And uh, yesterday, uh, the cabinet secretary indeed mm -hmm. called on Kenyans to apply for jobs in Canada. Yes. Uh, this was, you know, when he was uh, an, vi an official visit mm -hmm. to Canada. He held a meeting with the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship of Canada, uh, Sean Fraser. Mm -hmm. And uh, just with that, looking at, uh, you know, the issues that um, really surround uh, migrant labor, uh, talk to us about how, first of all, you know, as a department, you will ensure that there is safety and security guaranteed mm -hmm. to those Kenyans who are seeking, you know, job mm -hmm. opportunities outside there. Mm. Really, what is your agenda when mm -hmm. it comes to that? We'll come mm. back to the issue, especially that is really a hot potato when it comes to the Gulf countries. Mm -hmm. I know that's one of the biggest issues that mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you, you know, your department is looking into. Yeah. But when we're looking at, you know, uh, trying to create more jobs for Kenyans, mm -hmm. the unemployment rate in, in the country is quite massive and yeah. really hurting yeah. the economy yeah. so then you know it's it's a fantastic you know uh, opportunity yeah, for like kenyans that. to go and get jobs abroad but then do we have structures to ensure that you know when kenyans go there their welfare is catered mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. their security their safety this falls under your mandate right absolutely so uh yes diaspora jobs are right under our mandate um and let me start by saying that you're right unemployment is we don't have to talk about it. Everybody mm -hmm. knows that that is the thing that is eating us. Mm -hmm. Diaspora jobs offer an opportunity for us to actually get out of that. Mm. Our um, local job market exists, but we are one of the youngest countries, well, which is, not, uh, which is, which is an African um, sort of reality. Africa is the youngest continent in the sense that our mean age and I think our median age is 19. We are extremely uh, mm. youth. We have an extremely youthful population, right. very young, and and so our pyramid looks, you know, looks like this, right? As opposed to um, pyramids in uh, in a lot of Europe, which are sort of inverted, 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 <laughs> right? In terms of the population is, you know, uh, heavy at the top. Ours is heavy at the bottom, which right. is a great thing. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity. It is also s an opportunity that must be very well managed, or mm -hmm. we are going to to struggle. Right. Now, every year, Canada issues 500,000 immig immigration visas mm -hmm. where you can go to Canada and you can move to Canada and work. The categories available for work are huge. Diverse. Very diverse. Mm -hmm. So it's nurses, it's teachers, it's masons, it's seasonal agricultural workers, it's what one jengo, it's uh, uh, everything. Right. Maybe the people who have a hard time moving to Canada are lawyers like myself, right? So, so they have all of these different categories. Right. Canada has a good health system. Mm -hmm. Canada is a 
it's a great country for Kenyans to move to, to move and work there. A, a big part of Canada, of course, is English speaking. There's a French part. Um, but in terms of twinning, uh, sort of the amazing human capital we have with um, uh, um, destinations, then Canada would be a good one. So these conversations began. They began quite some time, even before uh, my waziri went to Canada. Mm -hmm. I think the week before that, we mm -hmm. had um, the, the uh, foreign minister from Canada here. Mm -hmm. uh, and we met with her, with Waziri and so on. And this conversation began, and she also had a meeting uh, with the president. And the president was quite, quite um, categorical in saying, can you open up your borders and opportunities for Kenyans to come and work in Canada? Mm. So for us as a State Department, getting Kenyans jobs abroad is probably mm -hmm. the thing that we have to wake up every day thinking about. Right. Um, and you know, HE has made it clear mm -hmm. that this is a big part of your deliverables. So working together with the Ministry of Labor and other ministries that sort of um, are the owners of a lot of the skills that we are looking for, working with TIVET, working um, with, uh, with health, for example, um, and education, then we must craft a very clear strategy. So Canada has these opportunities. Germany has 250,000 jobs every year, available every year. Mm. In 10 years, that number is going to be 7 million jobs, again, because of the shape of their pyramid, which corresponds very, very nicely with the shape of our pyramid. Right. Great opportunities. Austria has similar numbers. Mm -hmm. Australia has similar numbers. It is imperative for a country that is situated such as ours, as far as our labor issues are concerned, that we be looking outside. We have a fantastic education system. Okay, we have a fantastic human capital. Everybody knows that Kenyan workers will deliver. Mm -hmm. They're hard workers, they put their head down, they get it done. This keeps coming up all the time. They speak good English. You sort of, you assume that these are, I guess everyone speaks English or whatever, mm -hmm. but when you go out there and people say, we want your nurses. Um, not only are they hard workers, and not only do we think that your, um, the si your system for training nurses works well, but they speak English. Mm -hmm. So in places where so English, communication is, communication is critical, right. um, because you know, speaking one language allows you, particularly in places like healthcare, yeah. if, you're t if you're caring for people, bedside requires that you be able to speak, mm. speak the language and so on. Some of the things that we are doing then um, is broadening our language skills. So mm. English allows us to get into several markets without having you know, to jump through very many hoops. But we have all of these wonderful opportunities in Germany, for mm. example. No, we don't have as much um, German language capability here right. as we could. There are a number of schools that teach German, apart mm. from Goethe Institute and others. Uh, in high schools, we do. Uh, some of us took German in high school. Um, mm. But we could do more. Yeah. In, in fact, we must do more. So the conversation then, at the moment, is how do we increase German language teaching in TVETs? Mm -hmm. How do we introduce German language teaching in universities? How do you basically, uh, you know, I, I don't know how, um, how old you are, Zaina, but when I, when I left high school immediately, the thing that everybody did was computer applications. I think it was called packages at the time. <laughs> so everyone <laughs> did computer applications. And then they did um, IMS or CPA, mm -hmm. right, accounting. But this, Computer packages it was, was, was a, was a, it was a, it was a um, rite of passage. Mm -hmm. You went, you learned your word, you learned because your PowerPoint. You, uh, it wasn't you know? part of the high school program, Exactly, right? mm -hmm. but it was a thing, I think, that actually began the building of our, of our tech industry. Mm. Right now, Kenya has a very um, well-rated uh, tech uh, human capital, right? Language needs to be one of those things because language is a thing that will open up. Mm. The open up the world for Kenyan learners, for Kenyan workers. If you can speak German, mm. if you can speak German to you know B1 or B2 um, uh, cap capabilities right. as a testing, um, then you really will be able to move and do all of this work. If you speak German, you're able to get into German universities. Uh, so where the education opportunities is free. are much mm -hmm. better. They're much yeah. bigger. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So so mm -hmm. so so all that to say. One, the diaspora jobs answer 
the issue of unemployment in a very big way, but also allow us to think of ourselves as training not just for the Kenyan market, for, but for the world. Okay. And that will sort of tweak our posture in universities, even in primary schools and high schools in terms of how we learn. We have to be more outward, uh, outward looking and preparing ourselves to be global citizens, who we are becoming whether we want to or not, okay. right? Then the opportunities exist out there. Now the question that I haven't answered yet is, how then do we, as the State Department for Diaspora Affairs, or the broader Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs, um, ensure that Kenyans are protected when they're abroad? But actually, before you answer mm -hmm. that, right, mm. uh, I know that's a big issue, but uh, before that, so mm -hmm. I know a lot of Kenyans are quite excited uh, when the, the CS actually tweeted that, mm -hmm. um, you know, but there must be some sort of due diligence mm -hmm. from the yeah. ministry's part and yeah. there must there's a process because not everyone who wishes to go out there and and and, and you know work abroad uh, is liable to mm -hmm. is there a process what is the process because today i sit here mm -hmm. and i'm like look uh, i really 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 want to go to canada mm -hmm. i don't have a job and this is a great opportunity mm -hmm. i'm told that you know i can be part of this how do I get this job visa? Mm. What, do, what do I do? I'm just saying I have, maybe I, I have a bachelor's degree in, in so and so. Mm -hmm. what, where do I begin? That's an excellent question. And that is actually answering that question. If you see uh, my Waziri's tweet, one of the things he said is, mm -hmm. be careful. There are a lot of, okay, he didn't say that, use the language of charlatans, but there are <laughs> a lot of yeah. fake consultants out there who right. try to get you jobs in Canada. The agencies. The, the agencies, agencies and fake agencies. Right. There, are, there are legit sort of employment uh, agencies or recruitment agencies and then there are um, briefcase setups which mm. you know take your money and and, dis and disappear. I think you had covered in the news mm. some time back. Um, <laughs> this is a really unfortunate story but our family that sold a lot of mm. uh, you know their their wealth to send their their young, I think it was a man, mm. uh, for a job in the Middle East. They were cheated by uh, a, a rogue Agency. agent right. who met them at JK and then told them, ah, the flight has changed. It's oh, actually no. not being taken from JK, it's being taken to Wilson. At Wilson, the poor family moves to Wilson, the guy is put on a flight and lands in, I think, Eldoret. Oh my goodness. Eldoret is not in the diaspora, right. unfortunately. But the point is, there is, it's just a very rogue element mm. that takes advantage of Kenyans' desperation and this need for jobs, mm -hmm. which is why government must come in and give clarity, and this is what we are trying to do, on these are the legit ways to immigrate to Canada. These are the legit ways to get jobs and move to Germany. These are the legit ways to move to Austria. These are the legit ways. The National Employment Authority, for example, NEA, Mm -hmm. which is a, 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 you know, an agency, um, an authority under the Ministry of Labor, my, uh, my brother Kaituka's State Department, um, has a number of opportunities, for example. By the time they put up opportunities on the NEA um, website. website, those are legit, okay? Periodically on our website, on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, well, traditionally Ministry of Foreign Affairs, now uh, Affairs and Diaspora, um, we also put up opportunities that we know are credible. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what that does is before we put up an, a, a job advertisement or scholarships, because we also publish uh, scholarships mm -hmm. on the ministry's website, right. we have checked, and because we, we are uh, the foreign ministry, we have the ability to do this. We have checked with our embassies and said, confirm that these opportunities are legit and they mm -hmm. exist and so on. And these are people who can be trusted. And then we put those up. Of course, because people are hunting for jobs. And you, I mean, I don't know anybody It's, it's who, a desperate it's situation. It's very desperate. Right. So we have a lot of rogue elements that have taken advantage of that. And not just, not just for people to end up in uh, Eldoret, in the first case, as I mentioned, or to end up in jobs where they signed up to be teachers and find themselves to have been signed up as housemates and that kind of thing, but also human trafficking. Mm. Again, a huge problem that we have where you will put up an advert, you will see an advert, and these things, this is now the, the dark side of social media, where someone says, jobs in Thailand, mm. yeah, IT professionals needed, uh, 200,000 200, shillings per month, mm. you apply. Very quickly. Very quickly you apply. Um, the visas are processed in a sort of strange way. You're given a tourist visa, not a student visa first. You need to be concerned right. when you're given a tourist visa, when you're going for, no, not a, um, work permit when right. you're given a you need to be careful about the document that you're traveling on they give you a tourist visa uh, and they even pay for your ticket you end up in thailand but you know we we, we issued um a notice last year because you end up in thailand 
uh, there was no job. You're put in a, a van, uh, you're driven across the border, you find yourself in Myanmar. Wow. And then what happened to a number of Kenyans, and we put up communication about this end of last year and so on, is that they end up in these places which are, um, let's call them compounds, okay? Forced like, to do... Like holding areas? Not a holding area. Uh, let me... By compound, I mean tall walls, singenge uh, at the top. Um, and in there, it's guarded. And what, what happens in there is cybercrime. So you're basically to the case, Zainab, this is now your new job in, you, are, you had applied for a job in, in, in technology. So now you're a techie, so this is it. Create several uh, social media profiles and start catfishing. Mm -hmm. You need to find rich uh, men to send you money. Catfish. If you're not successful, then life gets very bad for you. Right. You can be sold into slavery. Uh, you can lose a kidney. Um, and so on. Very risky. So very dangerous stuff. Mm -hmm. As the government, we've had to rescue a number of Kenyans who have been stuck and who had been held mm. and rescued them and brought them back home, who had been trafficked on, the, on that sort of plan mm -hmm. that I've explained to you. Yes. This was at some point last year, about I, I think 80 or something, uh, 80 something Kenyans who we had to bring back as government. All this to say, that joblessness comes with so much wickedness around it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will build human trafficking rings and that kind of thing and so right. on. So all that to underscore my Waziri's point that... Due diligence. Due diligence. If, it, if it's too good to be true, really do think twice, but also check with us. Mm. We often get tweets that say, is this, you know, legit? And we take those seriously, we will, if it's coming from Thailand, for example, we will send it to our Balozi in Thailand and say, can you confirm this? And, you know, very often he'll write back and say, that's not legit, mm. stay away from that, and mm. so on. So, on our part as government, we can do more as far as educating Kenyans is concerned. Mm -hmm. And saying, I think something that looks like this. I think the problem is, mm -hmm. a, is a lack of information. So there's a lack of, there's a lack of information, and that is something I think as government we can do better in terms of getting people to understand not all How? advertisement for jobs are jobs right. but also for people to listen to us when we say this because Kenyans are enterprising but mm -hmm. Kenyans are mm, how do I say it, they're getting into trouble can be fairly focused and stubborn about something mm -hmm. we will say do not do this do not go to these places there are no jobs to mm -hmm. be found in uh, country X Y Z don't mm -hmm. go there mm -hmm they will still go. And you sort of understand because this, you know, the situation is desperate. But, so we can do more of that sort of to keep people safe before they leave home, mm -hmm. okay? We do also see a lot, um, Zainab, of um, uh, Kenyans being baited. And again, this you know, becomes a problem. It becomes, uh, you know, defense's problem. It, bec it becomes a big part of government problem where not just this human trafficking bit, but Kenyans get quote unquote um, dragged into uh, into trafficking drugs particularly into Asia. Mm. Right? So you're told is this, this is, this is a, So this, this is, is something that is actually of concern for it your is, state department. It is, absolutely. It it's, it's more of like a growing trend? It's a growing trend and it is very concerning because it's sort of the thing that's simmering under. And every and very regularly, you mm. know, our my our balozis in that part of the country will send me um, a list of this is how many can you know notification first of all that such and such a kenyan has been arrested mm -hmm. with drugs on him or drugs on her um and in asian countries in particular zainab mm -hmm. the punishment for drugs is very very stiff mm -hmm. and we do have a number of kenyans in jail mm -hmm. in these countries because of trafficking drugs in india because of trafficking gold dust mm -hmm. and these kinds of things so there is a big part for government to do, but also security does start with you. Yeah. Security starts with, so there is a personal responsibility bit as well. Don't carry drugs for people. Don't uh, believe, um, and we see this a lot, among young women who believe a uh, usually foreign boyfriend, mm. when he tells them, please carry, just carry this for me into Indonesia. Mm. Carry this for me into China and so on. And then of course, he's nowhere to be found when you're, when you're captured um, and then- Very you, risky very very risky so mm -hmm. that, that's that's you know so championing welfare and rights is a very it's a hot potato yeah so to go back to your, your original question which was about on how do you right. secure people right labor rights once they move mm -hmm. to this country 
it's a, because it's we've a, had cases of victimization of you know mm -hmm. uh, Kenyans in some of these areas mm -hmm. you know so then how do you come in to mm -hmm. help those Kenyans so several things firstly this is not something that as the Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs we can do alone mm. right so because there's a whole supply chain of getting people there it's something that we have to work on with Ministry of Labor for example mm -hmm. because a lot of the recruitment agencies and employment agencies are regulated by labor mm -hmm. um, as we negotiate bilateral labor agreements mm -hmm. our labor agreements can be more and the new um, uh, template for labor agreements that was um, created by the State Department for Labor is much more protective now. Mm -hmm. Is much more, um, looks much more into how do you secure uh, the rights of, of, of Kenyans who work there. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they're broader, they're, they're much more um, protective. So there is there's a creation of that. Then you have to work hand in hand with the government of the destination countries so that they're constantly looking out for your people. Your embassies, our embassies there have to be better um, resourced, mm -hmm. okay? So you have, in some cases, and part of it is a financing issue, part mm -hmm. of it, you have um, an embassy that has maybe a 10 strong team, a 10 person team, and of the 10 person team, maybe one person is a labor attaché, right? right. Covering 200,000 uh, Kenyan, uh, workers within so that country. That, it can't be that done. ratio is very... There, it, it can't be done. So in places where we have, and as we continue to be a country that sends out a, a bigger and bigger diaspora workforce, mm -hmm. then we also have to build um, capacity right. to protect them. I'll give you an example of what, uh, again, I'll, I'll speak about the Philippines one more time and then I'll, I'm done. No, with that's the Philippines. fine, because we <laughs> need to be aware of, of really how the situation is. So you have because to Because we also don't, mm -hmm. you know, we, we just hear of these reports and mm -hmm. uh, we don't even know how to, you know, get in touch with some of these Kenyans already. Because mm -hmm. they're, they're stuck, there's no yeah. communication, sometimes mm -hmm. you want to investigate, but mm -hmm. you also, it's impossible. Mm. Right. So, so let me say, so before we get... It's a really interesting conversation. So before mm -hmm. we get into that, let me just put out some information mm -hmm. that if you are a Kenyan in the diaspora working somewhere and you are in distress, mm -hmm. the first part of call is always the embassy. Sometimes I will get communication on social media that, well, I, you know, can somebody come and help us? My first point, my first question is, have you reached out to the embassy? Mm -hmm. Often, no. Often, someone's first whatever is to come on social media, maybe they don't know that they can go to the embassy or they can call the embassy or they can tweet the embassy, but that's the first place you can go. Because if you can come on social media and say, this and this is happening, you can email. Do, do, is it because so they feel like the embassy is, is passive? Is it mm -hmm. the reason why perhaps most of those distressed Kenyans mm -hmm. don't go to the embassy? Is mm -hmm. it the embassy, uh, you know, um, isn't receptive mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Kenyans' concerns mm -hmm. in, in some of those areas? So, so, you know, truthfully, I would have to say this. When I took this job, I did think that um, the embassies are passive or are unfeeling. I have found out in the last five months that the people who work in our embassies are some of the most hardworking, self-giving people I have met. I'll give you an example. I think in December, mm -hmm. um, a Kenyan woman who was distressed showed up at the embassy in Pretoria, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. She was clearly distressed. I think she was having a mental breakdown or a psychotic break. Uh, uh, she had two very young children in tow. Mm -hmm. It was not clear how she had gotten to South Africa. She didn't have any papers. She had a newborn, and I think a one and maybe two-year-old at most, maybe a year and a half, right? Two very little children and needed help. The embassy at the time did not have any funds. In Pretoria, we don't have a safe house, right? Mm -hmm. The embassy did not have funds to put up this person anywhere or funds at the time to you know, bring her home. Until we are able to get funds now here from capital for this Kenyan to be brought home, the staff go into their pocket and give money, okay? For her to be fed, for diapers to be bought, for her, they put her up in a, um, a little hotel somewhere mm -hmm. and so on. And they do this out of pocket. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, this is, wow, you guys, this is so kind. This was before I could, you know, uh, get a ticket and have the mother and her babies brought home, which we did. And that, uh, we're doing all this as they established first that she was a Kenyan and then prepared for her emergency travel documents for her and her children, got her safe and so on. 
I'm like, this is so kind. And they're like, Madam Pierce, why are you surprised? This is what we do in missions everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the embassy staff are constantly giving off their own resources, money. They take in uh, Kenyans who don't have, uh, who have fallen out of, out of rent and mm -hmm. they're distressed and they've shown up at the embassy and there is nowhere in the embassy for us to put them up. They will take them to their homes. Mm -hmm. They just say, oh, I'm Kenya. I'm not going to leave her on the street. You know, just come. You can sleep on my couch for a few days until we scramble. Here. So they are so people. They go out of their way. They go out of their way. They are people who are extremely hardworking. Mm -hmm. They are people who work sometimes with very little resources, but they go out of their way to help. Okay. So I have, found, I have found that out, and I've come to tell you that is the situation. But oh. having said that, mm -hmm. um, there is also, you've heard the thing that if someone repeats something long enough, uh, one could believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. If you go on social media, one of the things you will probably hear is that, ah, that embassy never picks up their phone. Mm. We call and they never and pick up. And we see that all the time. You hear that all the time, on, right? On social media. So sometime yeah. we did uh, a quick, um, we went out to verify that. My colleague said, oh, you guys, we are hearing that uh, this embassy here, people are complaining that you're not picking up your phone. They're like, we are sitting at the phone. It's not ringing. Mm. It's not ringing. Nobody has been calling and we're not picking. We are, we are looking at the phone. It's not ringing. So you go back to this person. You're like, but, you know, you're not calling. Nobody, they're watching the phone. Like, oh, you know, actually, I was told that when people call, uh, this mm. particular embassy is notorious for so not picking up. So there's already a narrative so there's uh, a narrative. that surrounds that. There's a narrative that surrounds that. And unfortunately, a lot, a lot of people will believe the narrative to be true without even trying it okay. for themselves. All right. So, so there are those issues. Mm -hmm. um, but... I have found that the embassies work, but we've also given solutions on how you can get in touch, even if you're not able to get help at the embassy or even if the embassy is overwhelmed and so on. Okay. So we do have uh, on, on our Twitter handle, at diaspora underscore KE, if you tag us with an issue, um, people will usually slide into the DM and help you sort that out. That out. But anybody who's distressed can also always email us, diaspora at MFA dot go dot ke mm -hmm. that is the distress email all right once you email that somebody will be in touch all right Pierce. we have to take mm -hmm. a, a very quick break here on mm -hmm. am live we still have a, a little bit more to cover when we come back so stay with us talk to us the hashtag we're using this morning is am live and tv at zainab ismail and we're going to be back in a short while so keep those questions coming i'll be reviewing some of those On my dark marks, I've tried everything from A to Z, even vitamin C, but hardly any results. Nivea Lumina 630 works from day one with visible results in just two weeks and 71% dark marks reduction in 12. Join the 1 million women already using the number one Lumina 630 from Nivea. With Molfix pants, changing diapers is now very easy. I tear and take off the used Molfix pants and pull the new one up in a moment. Wrap up the used diaper and throw it away. Come on mothers, try Molfix baby pants and be part of our happiness movement. Ready to showcase your football talent? The wait is over. Safaricom Chapa Demba is back. Bigger bolder and better. Safaricom is on the hunt for the next big footballing sensation. Register your team. Visit chapadimba.safaricom.co.ke and you too can be the next football star. Cheza Kamawewe. Daring Abroad makes me dare. It's the only show of its kind in the world. And now, it's bigger. And even more entertaining and informative than before. From London to Jersey Island. Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
to the scenic features of Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. And many more places abroad and at home. I watch uh, Daring Abroad. I like the stories which people bring. Daring Abroad every Saturday at 7.30 p.m. with repeats every Sunday at 1.30 p.m. on NTV. All right, welcome back. Thank you so much uh, for staying with us. You're watching AM Live on NTV. I am with uh, the Principal Secretary, State Department for Diaspora Affairs, Rosaline Njogu, just to uh, shed more light on the diaspora agenda, at least from the government's perspective, and a number of issues. We, were, we didn't really talk about, uh, and, and I know we skipped that part, but I want to tie it into uh, a question I mentioned earlier. It's on the welfare and security of Kenyans, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, yes, you've touched on it a little bit, but uh, I want to to focus on uh, the Kenyans who uh, distressed Kenyans because this the horror stories are there every single day mm -hmm. of Kenyans who are working uh, in the Gulf countries mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia in Qatar in, in, in some of these other countries as well within the Gulf uh, region just talk to us about um, the situation there because uh, a few months ago I saw that you had set up a uh, was it a safe space for mm -hmm. Kenyans, Sakan Center? I don't Sakan know if it was still there. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the Sakan Center mm -hmm. and tell us what really the situation is for Kenyans mm -hmm. there right now. How many okay. Kenyans do we have working in that part of the world? So great, great questions. And yes, I knew you were going to ask about the Gulf. Every mm -hmm. time I do this, everybody asks it about the Gulf. It has to because this it is, is important. This, we have to, we critical. keep reporting it about uh, the issues that those Kenyans are facing. Yeah. The, every single month, mm -hmm. there's always a case. You know? So let me. So thank you so much for that. This is really important uh, to talk about. Mm -hmm. One to say that we have. So in Saudi, for example, we are about now about two hundred thousand Kenyans living and working in Saudi Arabia. We have about sixty thousand in Qatar. Um, probably a little more. And our um, footprint as far as Kenyans working in the Gulf is growing. Mm. Um, the Gulf represents uh, sometimes a good culture fit as far as Kenya is concerned in terms of uh, uh, Kenyans who can work there. Um, Arab cultures and African cultures might not be very, very uh, different. Mm. Um, for some people, it's a good uh, faith mix. Mm -hmm. We do have a lot of Muslim uh, men and women working in the Gulf, for example. But also, it's, a, it, it's an open, open market as far as the labor is concerned. Right. Um, and we can't lump the whole Gulf together. So maybe if I, uh, I speak about Saudi, for example. Mm -hmm. Saudi has, uh, we have 200,000 Kenyans, as I said. The bulk of who are professionals. Is that exact data? That's about, that's a approximate, approximate. data. Yeah. Okay about 200,000 Kenyans. Um, but uh, the, the data we have for the, for the Middle East is a little better um, mm -hmm. than the data we have, say, for, uh, for these other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, um, the, of the 200,000, most of these Kenyans are actually professionals mm -hmm. in the sense of bankers, IT professionals, and so on. And increasingly, we'll see more and more healthcare workers, for example, moving there and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and we do have a, a large complement that is uh, domestic workers um, and that is uh, sort of lower, lower skill uh, workers such as security, um, security guards and so on. Mm -hmm. Let me say that <coughs> I think the questions of distress in the Middle East, uh, Zainab, are overreported. Mm. What do I mean? When when the headline screams another domestic worker dies mm -hmm. in Saudi, we will very quickly go and look, what do you mean a domestic worker has died in Saudi? Because first of all, of course, we're very concerned about people dying mm -hmm. um, in anywhere, Kenya, because we, I mean, we have to be involved in the repatriation and so on, but also because you know, there's a real cost of, there's a real loss of life uh, and livelihood and so on. But also because I'm like, wait, what are, what are we not getting right that somebody would have one more person died? But sometimes, as late as two weeks ago, headline screams, 
uh, you know, pass one more girl dies in Saudi Arabia. It was a road accident. Mm. Right, so, so, we, we've so you have associated any, any Kenyan who dies in the Middle East, whether it is a road accident, whether she was in hospital, wh whatever it is, people just take Saudi Arabia death, they just assume there was abuse, there was neglect and so on. But you must okay. appreciate the fact that the I do of appreciate abuse is high. I do. I do appreciate that we have had a number of concerns. And I'll tell you this, uh, and I know you've probably tracked this as well. In the time, in the period, in the five months that we've had a State Department for this working and we've had a new mm -hmm. sort of crop of government working on these issues and we have put a laser focus on the concerns we have seen in Saudi Arabia, you will agree with me that the issues have significantly reduced. Mm -hmm. You don't have as much drama reported as you, as you had before firstly part of that has been a big training mm -hmm. and uh, what do you call it clamping down on agencies that were not doing the right thing as far as sending kenyans abroad is concerned they're not doing pre-departure training um and 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 basically were sending people in very vulnerable states to go there um without knowing for example that if you take a contract for uh, a housekeeping job for example the way the system in Saudi works is that your contract, Zainab, mm -hmm. or your work permit is tied to, say, me as your employer, right? In the same way that if you went to work for a media house um, in, uh, uh, in Saudi, your work permit would still be tied to that particular employer. Mm -hmm. Not the government. No. So now, every, work permits will be issued fine by the government, but it is to tied work for to a particular so the contract of, is, yes. is literally in direct correlation to exactly that, that so it's company. not a work permit a blanket work permit right. it's a work permit to come and work for a particular person okay. now you cannot after having somebody sponsor your work permit mm -hmm. come and say i don't like this job anymore i'm going to move from rosa's house to patrick's house to work there mm -hmm. the way their system works is such that once you do that you're flagged in the system as what they call quote unquote a runaway mm -hmm. And once you are a runaway, you lose a number of benefits. First of all, in, um, in Saudi, for example, to exit the country, and this is, I think, one of the things that really I want people to understand, to exit the country, you must have an exit visa. Mm -hmm. So it is not like here where you will, um, if, you're if, if I'm hired in Tanzania, mm -hmm. right, and I'm unhappy with my employer, I quit my job, I take my bag, I jump on a bus, I cross the border, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's not the same in Saudi. You need an exit visa. So the same way you need a visa to enter, mm. you need a visa to exit. And you can be there a long time if you don't get a, an exit visa. So and the exit visa is granted by right. this sponsor of your work permit. So, so if I leave my employer mm -hmm. and, and, and I run away because of whatever case, mm -hmm. abuse or you know, mm -hmm. there was a disagreement, so what happens to me? Because then, of course, then I need so this exit visa. Yes. So what there are systems for you to break your contract, right? There is a way to alert the system that there is abuse. There is a way to alert the labor authorities that I want to exit my visa. You have to work with the labor authorities. You have to work with our embassy. So what happens if I don't agency. do that? Then you're stuck. And this is the point. You must work. There's a contract. You have mm -hmm. a contract here. At NTV, you I think. cannot breach it. You don't breach it, and if you want to exit your contract of employment here, there's a process. There's a process. You give notice, you serve your notice, you leave. Mm -hmm. Right? You don't today get, come upset, get upset here and say, I, I hate. I'm just you gonna know, leave and I, I, leave. I, I hate. I hate working with PSs. They are terrible. I'll not mm -hmm. be doing these shows or turn the table and walk out. Right? So you can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, but you should. Right. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. So, um, in the same way, there is a process for breaking your contract all right the problem we've had and i really want to be clear on this the problem we've had is that a number of uh kenyan employees uh, particularly in the domestic work space mm -hmm. have not followed the proper procedure for breaking the contract mm -hmm. so what they have done is you leave it's 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 similar to if my uh, if i had a housekeeper who decided i'm not gonna do this and she just you wake up one morning and she's gone yeah it's not you can do that here at home you mm -hmm. can't do that there right where you can't exit the country without the permission so then there is need for education there's need yes for there is need for there is need for information which is part of what because I our believe. cultures are different then. our cultures are different but also our need to respect contracts is really really important and that's something that we are 
covering the, the Ministry for Labor, uh, Minister for Ministry of Labor, right. is now really uh, in, in Atelier Mkazo. Yeah. That part of the training that says, if you must break your contract, this is the way to do it. So what our labor attache in Saudi, for example, does a lot of the time is people call with distress, ah, mimi nimetoka yo kazi. We're like, have you done one, two, three to get out of your contract? So now our labor attache has to do a lot of work sort of getting um, the parties to agree, the employer and the employee, or to basically say, it's okay, I can sign off her exit visa if she wants to leave and she can leave. If there has been abuse or if there has been a misunderstanding, we work with the agency that recruited the housekeeper here mm -hmm. and the Saudi agency that recruited the housekeeper there, okay? To get them to agree to get an exit visa done and for this girl to come home. Okay. We do this on a regular, regular basis. So then, but you do agree that there must be then some structure, some level of, of training that needs to be done uh, for those who, you know, are going out there. To, and it to is being done. It has to be done here. It is being done. Okay. It is being done. We have a concern among those who left before that was properly done because there were, there were gaps and there were lapses at some point. Mm. There is an aggressive campaign to educate. Right. But also for us to constantly say, if you have a problem, it is not useful for you to make a TikTok video and post it and put it out when things have gone so far. Mm. Reach out to us. What we have had is a lot of um, co collaboration with the Saudi government. The Saudi government has been very, very cooperative mm. as far as helping us deal with these issues is concerned. They have because reiterated- Because image too. Of course, mm. but they have reiterated, you know, uh, that look, we respect human rights. Look, this is not good for us for people to constantly, whenever you Google, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, these are the things that are coming up because social media, I guess, will live on forever. Mm -hmm. But they have been extremely, um, extremely cooperative with us as a government in terms of resolving those issues. We've worked very closely together. It, and I even had the mm -hmm. ambassador in my office last week, mm -hmm. again, just to figure out how do we strengthen this relationship? How do we make it better? Yeah. There is a, a committee that sits between our State Department, State Department for Labor, um, and uh, their Ministry for Labor in, um, in Saudi Arabia on a regular basis, I believe it is every two weeks, mm -hmm. to sort of deal with these emerging issues. One, so a, a lot of work has been done, Zainab, mm -hmm. to sort of strengthen this and All to right. clean, up, clean up the space. I'll say one last thing. Mm -hmm. We do have a problem among uh, what have been called Dalalas. So these are Kenyans who went to Saudi perhaps some time back, mm -hmm. um, left their contracts, often living in Saudi um, illegally, mm -hmm. and who draw out a number of housekeepers from their homes. And say, leave that job. We'll get um, you something. I'll get you something better. Basically, they put you in the black market. Mm. And once you're in the black market, once you leave your job, that is when bad things happen to you because you don't have the protection. Once you leave your contract, you can't access medical care. You can't go to a hospital uh, because, you're again, your, income, your medical insurance is linked to this contract. The same way, probably your medical country. insurance is linked to, you know, to, to, to nation media, right? So you can't, you can't get medical care. You're now a runaway or mm -hmm. sort of, quote unquote, fugitive from the system. Yeah. So you get into this black market work. You do housekeeping for other people. You make a little more money. Some people, unfortunately, go into sex work. Um, and then when things get very bad in the sense that now you have realized I don't want to live this life anymore, I must exit the country, um, or you have gotten sick mm -hmm. and you must uh, get medical cover or medical care, then we see these videos emerging. So, so a majority of um, uh, those Kenyans we see and we hear and you know, report are about... Are out of status. Are out of status. Are out of status. They have, breached, they have breached their contract. Right. They have gone to work in the quote-unquote black market. Mm -hmm. And then when that happens, it becomes very difficult for us to hold anybody accountable because you left the protection of the law, quote-unquote. Right. Yeah. We still help. We are government. This is your, these are Kenyans. These are citizens. These are citizens. The we still get them out. We still negotiate with, with, you know, with the Saudi government. We still try and get them exit visas. But do not make it so difficult for us okay. to help you. Just 
do the right thing. All right. Yeah. I'll just to move to something different. Sure, but interesting, uh, uh, you know, it's it's something that really mm. attracts uh, a huge debate. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, a comment here from, in fact, a question from Hassan Madola who says, mm. look, I have my sisters who went to Saudi. Mm -hmm. How can I protect them when I'm in Kenya? Give me a way of securing them. Uh, but I guess for you would be that's trying a, to communicate. That's a, that's a sweet sentiment because I have my sister. You can't, you, it's a sweet sentiment that he really wants to protect his sisters and mm -hmm. so on. The, what I would say to, is it Has, Hassan? Is it Hassan? Yes, what I would Hassan. say to Hassan is please make sure that they are registered with the embassy mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if, uh, and, just, and just check in on them. Uh, if anything, uh, you know, comes up, Again, I gave our email address, diaspora at mfa.go.ke, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, again, speak to our embassy um, in Riyadh. Uh, we, are, we are happy. We, are really, we really are here for Kenyans, and we are right. happy to help. Okay, so yeah. Sudan, humanitarian yes. crisis that, uh, you know, is, is escalating. Uh, it's a really tough situation there. Yeah. Uh, we saw, you know, the government moved into action. Mm -hmm. They, you know, evacuated the Kenyans there. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's all the Kenyans. We don't, uh, do we have an approximate number of Kenyans who are in Sudan? How many have mm -hmm. been evacuated? What's yeah. the situation? Was yeah. it just in Khartoum? Because we have other Kenyans in other parts of Sudan as well. Mm -hmm. What's the situation? An update. So that's, you know, Sudan has been a difficult one. Mm -hmm. So hostilities broke out, I think, a month and two days ago, right? right? Um, our numbers at the time indicated that we have about 3,000 Kenyans. Again, not clear numbers because Kenyans don't register with the embassy, as mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier. Um, so this was sort of data that we are triangulating from various points to say we think this is the number. So we went on an aggressive campaign. Um, I set up a multi-agency uh, team that brought in different parts of government mm -hmm. within hours of the conflict breaking, um, that brought a number of uh, agencies and state departments together. Um, and that allowed us to then create our response to uh, dealing with the crisis that was specifically facing dias our diaspora in, in, in Saudi. And we have different groups. We have, um, we had students, number of students in, uh, in various parts of Sudan, largely Khartoum. We have uh, a few domestic workers. We have a number of aid workers who work in uh, UN and other international organization bodies, and so on. So this is sort of uh, the profile of Kenyans uh, living and working in, in, in Sudan, a few, of course, working for private um, companies. Um, so immediately, of course, we set up an evacuation plan and we began to deploy it. We had the first cohort of Kenyans arrive maybe two or three days Maybe, no, maybe a, that first week we had the first, the first group arrive. First One of the things that happened, Zainab, is very quickly after the conflict broke is that the airspace was closed and has mm. been closed since. Up until now. Right. You couldn't fly in. Nobody could fly in or overfly Correct. Sudan. And that immediately complicates any evacuation plans. Mm. So a lot of uh, the evacuations we've done have had to have a road component mm. where you basically bus people from a gathering area either through Sudan, through South Sudan, mm. or through Ethiopia. There's a mm, little border town called Metema, or through a small border town called Renk in Sudan, South Sudan, or through Port Sudan. So, mm. you know, uh, Kenyans take the long drive to Port Sudan, and then port, from Port Sudan, the Saudi government has actually been running um, its naval ships mm. and has done a great job in helping um, many nationalities, including Kenyans, mm -hmm. sort of to evacuate. So they take them across the Red Sea, um, and then once they're in Jeddah, our embassy actually moved a number of officers to Jeddah from Riyadh, mm. where uh, the ambassador and a few officers were there helping Kenyans who don't have uh, documentation, giving them passports, uh, emergency travel documents, um, and coordinating with us so that we buy them air tickets and bring them home. Mm. Right? So that was the Port Sudan part. Um, we bust Kenyans, as I mentioned, to South Sudan and to uh, Ethiopia. And then we sent in planes to pick them from there. Mm. Uh, you probably saw the coverage on social media. We have my, 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 my team did this really, really cool video mm -hmm. of the evacuations, uh, right. evacuations of a stellar video, um, evacuations so far. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so that has been the journey. Mm -hmm. So far, I think about 500 and I want to say 70 or so uh, Kenyans, mm. um, maybe 600 have come home. We had 530 or so, 550 or so registered. 
After we went on a big blitz asking Kenyans, please register, please register, please register with us if you want to be evacuated. These are the phone numbers. And we gave phone numbers for you to call if you're in Sudan, phone numbers for you to call here in, a, here in Kenya mm -hmm. if you have family or friends in Sudan. Mm -hmm. And then with time, as the conflict progressed, then what we saw is Kenyans moving from Khartoum to the Sudan border, South Sudan border, South Sudan. Khartoum to Ethiopia border, to Port Sudan through the Red Sea, and then up to Wadi Haifa in, in Egypt. Mm. Right. So those are the different evacuation points that we have. So now we have teams um, and have had teams at all of those crossing points. We have our, our embassy from Cairo has a team now at the Wadi Haifa border, right, where Kenyans who, are, who have braved the desert, because that's a huge mm -hmm. desert, especially if you're coming, so braved the desert to go up to Egypt, then can be rescued from there. We are giving uh, travel documents. For mm -hmm. those who don't have travel documents, we are negotiating with governments that require, usually require visas for us to enter those countries and saying, waive the visa, these are people fleeing war, and then from there we put them on airplanes. They come home. Mm -hmm. We've paid, of course, for all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, so those are sort of the different extraction points. But the other thing we've done uh, as Kenya is we have also allowed um, the UN, we've allowed Canada, we've allowed a number of countries who are evacuating their uh, nationals to use Nairobi as a staging area. Mm -hmm. So we are really a very open So what are the numbers? Country. What are the numbers? Do we so still have Ke Kenyans stuck there? We still have some Kenyans. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, 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 the way the conflict has worked is, mm -hmm. Well, firstly, Kenyans have responded a little slower than we thought they would. When we did say, come to the staging area and we publish where the staging area is, and of course our embassy team has been working day and night, mm -hmm. again under the reign of gunfire, to sort of get people to come to the staging area. Mm -hmm. As soon as there's a little bit of calm, people dash to the staging area, and then they are bust and so on. Mm -hmm. So they have come in batches. We expected, I guess, that they would all come at the same time, and <laughs> then it would be a huge convoy. We right. had that. We left. We had the first like two convoys, and then... After that, you know, the embassy calls and says, more Kenyans have showed up today. Mm -hmm. We think we'll be able to fill a bus tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so even now, as of this morning, I still have, you know, Kenyans who are gathering and coming. But largely... So how many uh, Kenyans have been evacuated so far? So fi about 500 and, uh, I want to say 590 or so. Mm -hmm. About 590 who we have evacuated as government. A few came with their, uh, were evacuated by their employers, such as the UN and so on. So really... Of a thousand, if you count the evacuations by uh, by the UN and these other bodies, um, and so on. So we are still in touch with others mm -hmm. to find out: Have you now come out? We have already evacuated more than those who registered. Okay. So, but you know, we are still expecting Kenyans to. The fl our flag is still flying in Khartoum. Mm -hmm. So any Kenyan who is still able to get out and get to us, they are still being evacuated. We still have a team on the ground. All right. To say that the conflict. Uh, has been hot in some particular areas um, and sometimes it has been difficult for not just Kenyans but for anybody who's caught up sort of in that hot area to come out mm. so it's still an evolving situation that it's not done because we had students you know students we had students students were among the first to get out right. um, because you know students are fairly vulnerable they are young they don't mm. have much money and so on so we were very careful uh, to to um, prioritize students mm -hmm. and to prioritize do domestic workers mm. because there's a level of vulnerability that comes with with that so we prioritized those and those have you know have continued to get out um, we had tiny babies coming we had a uh, 14 day old baby arriving uh, we've had some you know fairly unwell and so on so it's a it's a good story mm -hmm. in the sense that the rescue the large part of the rescue has happened we are still on the ground. We are still doing this. We do hope that there is a cessation of hostilities soon because the, the damage and the um, suffering that has been caused by this conflict is, is untold. Indeed. And, and, and the, you know, uh, there is you know, concern of implications in the region as well with mm -hmm. regard to that conflict. Yes, absolutely. But look, we're almost running out of time. Mm -hmm. But there's a topic that <laughs> I had not touched on, and yes. I see there's a lot of people asking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite wide mm -hmm. so i will probably just give you a minute to mm -hmm. to to you know, <laughs> respond to that it's about remittances yeah it's quite big because um from the latest data 43.7 billion shillings that's what 
people who were living abroad, working and living, sent home to Kenya. 400 billion. 43.7 billion Kenya shillings, yeah? 437 billion. 437 billion? Mm -hmm. So this is, oh, okay, so I must mm. have gotten it. Uh, yeah, it's correct? about 4 billion dollars last year. 4 billion dollars. Yeah. Oh, so year. I think mm -hmm. maybe I might have gotten mm -hmm. that in, in, in dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So can, I can imagine this is such a huge rise, even mm -hmm. compared to, you know, the same period last year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Kenyans who are sending this money, how do you attract, you know, the investment? How do you create? Because it has, they're really helping in the economic growth of this country. Mm -hmm. It's huge. It's surpassed what our export, coffee export, our tourism yeah. industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is an area that the government must step into. Yes, absolutely. So, so <laughs> you know, for a long time in the early part of my term in this uh, new appointment, Anytime we talked about diaspora, the first thing people said, ah, remittances. Right. Right? So because people had assumed, had sort of figured diaspora is about remittances. It's a big part of that. Right. Um, but you have to take care of the diasporans before you can talk about remittances. Correct. Otherwise, people you do must begin to take feel like of you, have to take care of, you have to take care of their concerns, you have right. to secure people, and so on. But let me say this about remittances. Right. Last year, uh, remittances about $4 billion, as I mentioned, right. which has been you know, rising. Um, and you're right to say that in terms of forex and um, higher than tea, higher than coffee, higher than uh, tourism, mm. uh, higher than horticulture. So basically, um, I have brought in the dollars. <laughs> you're <laughs> doing kidding. a good job, I'm right? I'm kidding. <laughs> so all I have to say, to say that, and largely the numbers from CBK indicate right. that um, those remittances were largely for consumption right. it is basically me sending money home uh for my children's school fees it is me sending a little bit of money uh for medical for medical care for my parents and so on very little of that has been investment mm. world bank figures world bank figures tell us that those remittances are only five percent of the disposable income of our diaspora mm. five percent only five percent so, so we want them to send more, not necessarily to support family, they are already doing that, but to invest. To invest. Imagine if we could get them to invest 5% of their disposable income at home. But do we have that environment yes. to create that environment Absolutely. for them to invest in I what? Think we Startups, do. Some in of the SMEs, in, yes. in all these areas. And SMEs are, are really the, um, the, the uh, engine right. of the economy. Some of the things that we've seen diasporans doing, for example, is um, the, the GIZ has, uh, has a program called We Do, which basically is diasporans who want to support small businesses at home. They get a matched grant. So Let's say I am living in um, Germany mm -hmm. and my cousin has a juice shop mm -hmm. and he needs uh, 250,000 shillings to get it off the ground or to scale it, right? I can put in mm -hmm. 250, I can put in 2,500 euro. Mm -hmm. He puts in 2,500 euro. GIZ will double that, mm -hmm. will put in 5,000 euro. Right. So this matching grant allows diasporians to invest back home, but also to bring with them more funds in form of a grant. All right. Right. So, the, so, so, so these are some of the ways that um, they can do this. But increasingly, we want we want Kenyans away from home to invest in. Um, we have talked about doing a diaspora bond uh, with Treasury. We want them to invest in that. We want them to invest in real estate. Right. We want them to invest in, in uh, tree lots. We want them to invest in technology. There's lots and lots of opportunities. Right. We have been doing investment uh, webinars uh, for the diaspora on areas that they can invest in. Um, and this is something we will keep doing because we okay. want them to really, really bring in the, inv the, the remittances for investment. Fantastic. Yeah. And thank you, Principal Secretary, mm -hmm. State Department of Diaspora Affairs, Rosaline Njogu, for coming in this morning. I know that, that's an area, but we have to come back and have that conversation. <laughs> absolutely. Probably even absolutely. have some of the Kenyans living there come in into the show and yes. you know, just give their concerns and some of their, their views on the same. But thank absolutely. you uh, for coming in and you know sharing and shedding more light and mm -hmm. you know the agenda of, of the government for those who are living mm -hmm. and working abroad. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, they still, you know, we wish you the best because I know there's still much more that needs to be done. Absolutely. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so well, much. this is where AM Live ends at this point, but Winnie Lubembe is coming up shortly with Your World.
that talk to us. I can see, I'll be actually giving the questions that you're sending me to the PS uh, <laughs> off the record. Probably she'll be responding to some of them online. I'll, I'll on Twitter. And she's Twitter. very, very active on Twitter, by the way. You can always uh, follow her on Twitter. Uh, that's it. Uh, my name is Zena Bismay. Have yourself a good morning. Thank you.